sleep my health, and I'll tell you why I love sleep medicine so much. So um, I'm originally from Davis, at Davis High School, and um, I wasn't that great of a student, actually. And um, I went to community colleges for three years before I transferred to Davis, and I got my ag degree in international ag development. So I was going to go to the Peace Corps and um, change the world with plant breeding and things of that sort. About mid midway, I actually changed and decided I want to go to medical school. So uh, I, got it. I went to UC San Diego for med school. And uh, it was tough. It was tough to get in. It was tough to stay in. But uh, I stayed and stuck it out. And, and, uh, and then I got, went through my residency over in, in Fresno here uh, in family practice. And then uh, just about, um, see, I finished residency. I was doing family practice for about a year. And I was actually working with the UCSF Alzheimer's Center. And then that grant kind of bellied up as far as funding to pay me. So I was looking for work and for extra work, uh, part-time work, and ended up doing some sleep. And as soon as I got into sleep, I'm like, oh my gosh, this all makes sense. So the reason why is because people actually get better. Uh, and people are happier after the fact. Usually a person who comes to me uh, usually is really sleep deprived, tired, you know, it's tired of being tired type of thing. And uh, it's very gratifying. I think um, somewhere along the future we can talk about, you know, things, things that I would, if I was an interviewer for medical school, there's a few things I would ask you, and we can probably go into that now, but or later. But anyway, let's talk about sleep medicine. So I'm actually associated with two sleep labs. Uh, both are accredited by the American Academy of Sleep Medicine. And that means that we have to be on the up and up when it comes to the rules and regulations put forth by the American Academy. And so there are authorities, government authorities, that actually oversee us. I have to be, you have to be, I have a board of doc physician, that's me. And uh, so I've been practicing sleep medicine since 1999. So about the history of sleep. Uh, basically, it wasn't really until the 1970s when sleep medicine came to the physicians. Because right now, at the time before that, it was actually all research. And there was a lot of research that needed to be done regarding REM sleep, non-REM sleep, you know, how much time we need to sleep, what kind of things we get out of sleep, and things of that sort. So uh, it really didn't come to us until the 1970s, and then not until the 1980s is then we actually had treatment for sleep, ap uh, sleep apnea. And we'll talk about that in a, while, in a minute. But sleep apnea, in a, in a short summary, is basically where you're sleeping, you become more and more relaxed throughout the night into deeper and deeper stages of sleep, and the tongue falls back, you start snoring and then you stop breathing, kind of like this. And some people, like the, the guy who held the record in my office was 100, 119 seconds, complete stoppage. And so uh, at the time, prior to sleep medicine coming to the physicians, uh, there was only one treatment. Does anybody know what that treatment was? Tracheostomy. And then in the 1980s came the CPAP, Continuous Positive Airway Pressure Therapy. So basically what it is, it's an air splint that basically helps open up the airway so you're not snoring anymore. And it's not until the 1990s until the present day is actually we're getting the information out to the primaries, to the public. Uh, I'm not sure if you saw this in the paper recently. It was, I think it was a train wreck recently. Philadelphia, I think. And I saw in the paper yesterday claiming that the guy was sleepy and they didn't evaluate him for sleep apnea. So I think um, the way they were saying it is that you know, Trump's trying to back off the requirements, the, the uh, regulations, the governmental regulations to getting these people evaluated. So, you know, and basically didn't evaluate him and he ended up, you know, falling asleep and getting in a wreck. Wasn't paying attention. That's the tracheosomy. Not a whole lot of takers for that. This particular guy, actually, he wanted this. I don't know why. I mean, he wanted it. <laughs> he got it. 
Okay, so why do we sleep? Anybody have any ideas of why we sleep? Yes. Right, very good. So that would be memory and learning theory, brain restoration theory. And during dream sleep is when we actually would uh, do a lot of that. This is all theory, theorized, okay? So this is just theory. Uh, then there's the body repair therapy during stage three and four sleep is when the immune system, cancer surveillance system kicks in, body repair. This is how you get over your aches and pains. You've been working out hard, what have you. The unlearnings theory, that's actually kind of imper important because say you look at my tie, I can ask you what, I'm, uh, what I wore in about 15 minutes from now, you remember, but you're not supposed to remember. It's just junk. So what do you do? You dream it out tonight. Um, thermal regulation th and energy conservation theory, basically uh, sleep really is the captain of the ship. It's running the hormones, body temperature, immune system, um, GI tract. So if you're not sleeping well, something is happening. Upset stomach, I'm always too cold, too hot, I'm not feeling rested, I'm, not, I'm feeling depressed. There's a lot of things to it, to sleep. So, the question of how much sleep a patient needs is not the same question as how much sleep is statistic, statistically normal for a patient of certain age, sex, and so on. So, an infant at one to 15 days old should be getting 16 hours. So that's basically 10 hours at night, but they'll be waking up for feed, two feeds, and then two naps during the day. Three to five months, 14 hours, so it's slowly getting less and less. Okay, let's talk about where you guys are at. You're high schoolers, uh, 14 to 18 years, nine hours right now, and for you seniors, you're probably getting about eight hours, which, which is normal. And um, guys like myself, 50 plus, about six plus hours. But the question of how much sleep a patient needs often turns on how much sleep is necessary for a patient to awaken, refresh, feel alert during the day, and perform at a reasonably high level. So we're going to do a, a little experiment here. I want everybody to raise one hand, please, and keep it up. OK. Now, I want you to put your hand down if you wake up more than two times. Put your hand down if you wake up unrefreshed. Put your hand down if you find yourself sleepy in the morning. So, okay, and then put your hand down if you require more than one caffeinated beverage. But she's the one, she was, she was hanging. So how many coffees do you drink normally? One, so just one, okay, that's good. So ideally, you should be able to sleep through the night, feel refreshed after eight hours, and be able to get through the day without caffeine. That's tough for high schoolers. Uh, my daughter is a senior, and she's, uh, I mean, it aches me to see her up late doing homework, which is a little bit less now as a senior, but still. So um, it's about timing. So think about this for college, okay? Try to optimize your time because you will be able to perform better on your test if you sleep better. You might think, like I did in college, in, high, in uh, medical school, that putting more time in, doing all-nighters, I'm gonna perform better on my test. It actually almost becomes opposite. So uh, you don't do as well. So let's talk about sleep quality. Um, you can break up sleep into macrostructure and microstructure. So we're talking about the sleep states and stages. Okay, so you have non-REM and REM sleep. REM sleep is dream sleep. And the stages are stage one, two, three, and four, and then REM sleep. The sleep cycles, there's about four to six cycles uh, that we experience at night, assuming this, everything's normal. And then you have uh, the sleep latency. It's the time that you put your head down, turn the lights off, and you fall asleep. What's normal latency? 
the time to be able to fall asleep? Anybody know? 20 minutes or less? Sleep efficiency is the amount of time you're in bed compared to the amount of time you're asleep. So a lot of times we're on our phones or something like that, and so there's actually a lot more time awake in bed versus sleeping. And then wakefulness after sleep onset. That's, this, is what, this is the key of what I do. This is what I see professionally. So this is what we call a hypnogram. So you can see, starting at wakefulness, you're really only asleep for what, 20 minutes, I mean awake for the first 20 minutes and then you fall asleep in stage one. But if you go across, you see that stage one is really not present throughout the whole night except for that first portion right there. And that's what, 8%? Hardly anything. Look at stage two and go across, all the way across, and you can see stage two, and that's about 45 to 55%. So stage two is actually a holding stage. It's not really very deep. In fact, if you know, somebody came into your room and did this, you're gonna wake up out of stage two. So it's not deep enough. And then you cycle down, so it's basically, you can see it's stage one, two, three, four, REM, stage two, three, four, REM, and so forth. And there's four to six cycles. So you can see stage three and four, which are, the, remember this, the immune system, body repair system. You can see how it's actually diminishing as the night wears on. And look at dreams, which is the black mark, the black marked area. And that's actually getting more and more profound. So a lot of you remember waking up out of your dreams in the morning. So if I was to tell you I had a patient who went from wakefulness to REM sleep very quickly, didn't go through the regular cycles, what's the name of that disease? Go ahead. If you get... Yes. What's the name? Yeah, exactly. So if I was narcoleptic and, and uh, Mr. Carlos was going to give me a, a, a joke or something, like that, I start laughing like crazy and I'm going to crash. So they actually genetically engineered Doberman pincers and some other animals to doing this. So they get them all excited and they just fall. They fall asleep. Babies do that. You're not supposed to be able to do that. Imagine if you did that while you're driving. Disastrous. So it's actually abnormal. Um, usually the stages of sleep, it stays the same throughout the lifetime, throughout your entire lifetime. So you will have the same stages and, and cycles. It's during stage three and four it actually kind of diminishes as we get older. Um, so I want to focus on that first one, arousals. So let's talk about arousal, because this will be a subject for more conversation uh, later on. So an arousal is actually going from a deep stage of sleep, like stage three and four, or REM sleep, into stage two, or stage one. Okay, so that's kind of what I, what I do throughout, what I'm looking at is why a person's waking up from deep to lighter stage because it's very unrefreshing. Even though you might be waking up once or twice, a person could be waking up or arousing themselves many times throughout the night. Like earlier today, I saw a lady, we did a sleep study and she's waking up, uh, she's having sleep apnea, which is related to arousal, 75 times an hour. That's a lot, and her oxygen's dropping pretty, a lot too, so it causes a problem. It causes, it, it basically, leads to a very, very tired person throughout the day. So I'm looking to see what's, why there are so many, there's so much fragmentation in the sleep. Remember, it's not necessarily waking up into a full alertness. We're going from a deep to a lighter stage. You're supposed to go into those regular cycles. So let's talk about arousals. Um, you're familiar with night terrors, Sleepwalking, bedwetting, sleep driving, sleep cooking, sleep talking, okay? That's all part of the arousal thing. So just to explain to you how that works. 
let's say that beyond this room, okay, so this whole building is our brain, but in this room is our brain while it's asleep. Okay, so during the day, you're walking through the building, you're awake, you're doing fine, and then it's time to go to bed and you go to sleep, so you walk through the door. And now you're going to stage one, remember it's only 8%, and then you go another distance beyond there, and there's about uh, 45 to 55% of stage two, and then now is your cycle, okay? Stage three, four here, and then REM sleep is the, the wall here. And you're gonna cycle two, three, four, REM, two, three, four, REM. Okay, so let's talk about sleep apnea. Let's say that sleep apnea is this huge gorilla right there on REM sleep, because REM sleep is usually when apnea is the worst. So as you're cycling, stage three, four, REM, you hit this gorilla. This gorilla pushes you so far, so hard and so fast. You're, you're walking, you're basically getting pushed through the doorway, but instead of going out the door, you put your arms out, and now you're caught. Now you're walking, you're talking, peeing, the whole thing. So you're getting caught between wakefulness and sleep. And sleep. That's, that's called uh, night terrors, uh, all those things are all related. They're called parasomnias. And that's what I look for is these arousals. This arousals is a big, big to do when it comes to sleep. This presentation is usually I, I make to the nursing, uh, nursing school over in Fresno State. So there's a lot of things. So this problem that we have with sleep causes future problems, health disease health disorders, high blood pressure, cardiovascular disease, history of stroke, daytime sleepiness, history of motor vehicle accidents, occupational accidents, this is what we saw on the train accidents in Philadelphia, poor motivation, mood, performance at work or school, difficulties during pregnancy, diminished quality of life, and insomnias. I will guarantee you there's at least five students here who has a parent who's having problems sleeping. It might be up to you to say, hey, dad or mom, I just had a presentation from a doctor and he says, you've got to have this and this and this on board. So if your parent snores and is waking up a lot at night and uh, they claim that they have to go pee a lot and feeling unrefreshed and drinking a lot of caffeine and maybe sleepy on the road or grouchy when they come back, Maybe need to get evaluation. But um, you'll know this when you go to college, okay? So in college, everybody's going to party eventually. Um, and uh, if you find that the person who's driving is rolling down the window, cranking up the radio, that person is sleepy. Just tell them, hey, I'll drive, pull over the side of the road, or let's just... I'm too tired to drive too, let's just sleep it off. Pull over. Don't, don't get into that, that situation. Because they've done some studies already on, on uh, sleepy driving. So here's, here's one of the studies. It was, a, it was a good, good study. They took these professional drivers and uh, they made sure that these drivers, we're talking about UPS, postal, truck drivers and so forth. And they made sure that these drivers were driving, that were sleeping perfectly. Okay, no problems with sleep. They put them in front of a driving simulator with EEGs, brain leads and everything like that, and they're watching them, and they put them through the simulator, which basically goes through a whole bunch of different challenging situations. You know, here's a rock in the road, you know, get out of the way, and, and uh, things of that sort. And so most of them actually did pretty well. All of them actually did real well. And then they systematically took one group and deprived them of one hour, another two hours, another three hours, another four hours. So they brought them back to the driving simulators. Which group got into the most accidents? It's obvious, right? The one that got four hours de uh, deprived of sleep. Why? We were thinking basically it's because uh, they were falling asleep. They were not falling asleep. There was little microsleeps on the brain EEG. So they're basically, we're talking of microsleeps about one, two seconds tops. But they didn't get into accidents at that time. 
So they're driving along, they're deprived four hours of sleep, and then here comes this big boulder. You know, the guy, the observer is basically saying, how come they're not getting out of the way? And then all of a sudden, last minute, psh, but it's too late. They got in an accident because they weren't paying attention because they were sleep deprived. That's what happened in, in Philadelphia, that train wreck. So some of the disorders that I see and mainly is obstructive sleep apnea, where you stop breathing, I'll talk about that in a minute. Periodic limb movement disorder. This is while you're asleep. We actually do, during the sleep study, we actually put leads on your legs, and you can see your toes doing this. I, I had a lady who came in, she was doing it almost, what, 800 times, about 43 times per hour, it was amazing. Restless leg syndrome. If I'm, I was, I've been observing, and I don't see any restlessness here, so I don't think there's not many restless legs here, but uh, uh, vitamin E actually helps this. If you've got this kind of this discomfort and you've got to move, this is why you're awake, why you're in bed, and you've got you to tap or you've got to move. Some people have to get out of bed and start walking. That's restless legs. That's, why, that's a diagnosis made while you're awake. Periodic limb movement is what we do while you're asleep, diagnosis. And then inadequate sleep hygiene. This is more applies to you. So sleep apnea, under normal circumstances, when you're sleeping and you're in a very light stage of sleep, you're able to breathe fine. You can see that air going through. Not a problem. It's when you get into deeper and deeper stages of sleep. You see how that palate falls back, the tongue falls back. No air gets through. Okay, let's go to inadequate sleep hygiene. So these are the things you have control of. If you're, if you're taking a nap in the afternoon, you're going to take away the power to sleep at night. But if you're a student, I, I'm, you throw it out the window because you're a student or whatever, you're in training, because you have to do what you got to do to survive, to get through the day or through your curriculum, academics but under normal circumstances. Uh, if you are going to bed at different times, that's a very interesting concept. It all has to do with circadian clock. So how many, hour, how many days will it take for you to get adapted to Boston time? We're in California, so three hours ahead. How many days is it going to take to get used to Boston time? Three days. Easy math. So if a person's going to bed between, you know, uh, 9 and 12, you're messing with your circadian clock. It's hard to set. So it would be best if you just go to bed at the same time, get up at the same time. Now, we have a lot of mechanisms in our body to help adjust for those abnormalities. For example, let's say there's this guy who's super OCD, goes to bed at 10 and gets up at 6 every single day, even when he's not working, okay? He puts his alarm on in his watch, and he says, okay, it's time for me to go to bed, puts his alarm off to wake up, and he wakes up at 6. Then one day, he doesn't have his watch, there's no electricity. What is he going to rely on? His body clock, the circadian clock. And his clock is going to say, okay, it's time to go to bed. I'm so sleepy, I'm going to just pass out. And then his clock's going to wake him up at 6 o'clock on his own. So let's say you graduate from high school. Uh, this guy has a nephew or niece who graduated from high school. You have this party. You're up till 1 o'clock. And he's not going to be rude to go back, go home at 10 o'clock. So he's going to stay up. And now his clock is 10 o'clock. 10 o'clock going to bedtime is ready to just, hey, shut down. Time to shut down at 10. So he's dragging from 10 to 1. And then he passes out at 1 o'clock, and does he sleep in? He does. Is it, really, is, it, is it really worthwhile sleeping in? It's not, because that clock that wakes him up at 6 is trying to wake him up at 6 from whenever he wakes up, say, at about 9 o'clock in the morning. So what, what we have is we have another clock, which is a balance clock, which is saying, hey, you were up late, stay, sleep in. 
But if you sleep in beyond six, which is, which is atypical what you normally do, it's garbage sleep. It doesn't, it's just not very refreshing. So it's better just to wake up and then take a nap later on in the day. Don't try to fight that clock. Um, there's jet lag. Jet lag is a sleep disorder. Shift work sleep disorder. So someone, someone here is going to end up being a shift worker working at nights. So what do people do? They always come in and they say, oh, when on my day's off, I shift back to uh, you know, sleeping at night with my family or my husband or my wife, and I stay up during the day. What did I just say? What's the, what's, how long does it take to get to Boston time? Three days? What they're doing is they're going to Japan for two days, and then they're coming back to California to go work on shift work. You can't do that. It's too tough. So it's just better as a shift worker just to stay on that shift even on your days off. But it wrecks your social life. It's really, really hard. Um, you don't want to exercise too close to bedtime. And uh, for those of you who actually do the, um, the um, protein powder, a lot of that has caffeine in it. Anything that has green tea has caffeine in it. Okay, somehow the makers of green tea have been able to not have to put in that there's caffeine in it, but there's caffeine in it. So you don't want to, uh, for you, uh, roughly how many hours do you think the caffeine's gonna last for, for this age group? About 10? For me, probably closer to 12. Um, so really what you want to do is you want to wind down Getting close to bedtime, you want to wind down, you want to relax your mind. I have a lot of people who come in, uh, particularly mothers, you know, they, they, they wind down, they go to bed, they watch TV in bed, which is a no-no, and they forget about everything that's going on, they turn the TV off, and guess what? All those things come back. Now it's a hard time falling asleep, so they turn the TV on and says, oh, I, I need the TV on, it helps me go to sleep. Well, you haven't taken care of business, that mental thing, earlier on. So you want it cool enough, not too hot, not too cold. Uh, try to stay in a quiet environment. Um, eventually, some of you guys are going to be in the dorms, you know, in college. It's going to be kind of loud, so disruptive. So put some earplugs maybe to help you with the noise factor. Um, so what I have, what I do is basically I recognize the patient who has a sleep problem. Uh, usually the primary care doctor sends a referral to me. So I do the assessment and then I'll either do a home sleep test. Uh, polysomnography is actually a study in the lab. So you have brain EEGs, EOGs, EMGs, EKGs, chest leads, a belt. It's pretty busy. And uh, we do some blood tests, sleep diaries. Basically, do treatment, outcome, and I just follow people regularly. And most of my clients, I'm proud to say, are, are do very well. I actually have sleep apnea, so I can relate to my patients. I've been using a machine for 18 years, and uh, it really is a game changer for me. I was waking up twice. I was waking up unrefreshed, pretty grouchy. I was sleepy on the road to work, to home from work. Uh, I was snoring on my back, had to sleep on my side. But after a while, it just wasn't working. I was 10 pounds heavier than I am now. My blood pressure started going up a little bit. And I'm freaking out with my blood pressure going up because I've been working out since high school. And I didn't deserve that. I mean, I tried everything in my power to try to keep from going through the same thing my grandparents went through. So, uh, and a long story short, basically I get on the machine that first morning, I'm like, oh my God, I don't need a shower to wake me up. And I, it's been, you know, I, 10 pounds melted off because I was already working out. And I lost 10 pounds and I'm like thinking, gosh, I thought I was buffed, I wasn't buffed. So, and I'm lifting more and I'm running farther. My blood pressure now to date, and I'm very proud of it, is lower than normal. So, um, this is what sleep does. It is the fountain of youth. 
We've been looking for it forever. It's been there the whole time, my opinion. Any questions? Yes. So it's distract, distracting, okay? So I tell my patients, um, the bed is just really for sleep. Yeah, I actually add something else to that, but um, it's just for sleep. Because what happens is that if you start doing activities in bed, it takes away from what bed is supposed to be. Are you familiar with Pavlov's dog? Okay, so remember, Dr. Pavlov, Notice that his dog was slobbering. Okay, he says, I'm going to do a little trick and see. I'm going, to, I'm going to ring the bell and feed the dog later. And the dog started slobbering with the bell. Okay, and then Dr. Pavla says, I'm, I'm, going to ring, I'm going to ring the bell, but I won't feed the dog for a while. The dog figured out that I'm not going to get fed anymore, so I'm going to stop slobbering. So what he did is Dr. Pavlov extinguished the relationship of the bell and the food. If you recall, when you were a little girl, your parents put you down, or you brush your teeth, you go to bed, light, read a book, you get a book read to you, lights off, you pass out. Okay? So what has happened is you put in something new into it, and that's disruptive. It doesn't, because even re, brush, brushing your teeth should be programming, just like the dog, oh, hey, it's time to go to sleep. I'm going to start winding down, and my brain's going to start mellowing out a little bit. So you don't want to have too many activities, especially the, uh, the phones. Blue light. The blue light, it's, it's basically similar to the light of the sun. And so it's going, to, it's, not going to, it's going to prevent the melatonin, the natural melatonin, the sleep hormone, to come, into, to come on board. So you're preventing that from happening. Dark is our natural, natural sleep indicator uh, trigger for melatonin to come on board. And now we're going to, okay, I'm getting sleepy. It's time to go to bed. Other questions? Yes. Uh, you talked a lot about sleep deprivation, but what about oversleeping? Oversleeping. So that's, that's a great question because oversleeping could be an indicator that something is not going well during the typical sleep period. And so what people do is that they compensate for what they lack in quality, they make up in quantity. So it might be an indicator of problems. Yes. What do things like restless leg syndrome and stuff like that have to do with sleep? Okay, so that makes it difficult for, to fall asleep. Because restless legs, you're, and it's really tough to fall asleep because it's just anxiety. It just keeps driving and driving and driving. You can't fall asleep. Because restless legs is, is this irresistible drive to move. And it's better when you move. But how are we gonna fall asleep when I've got this irresistible drive to move? I took um, this medication, it was an antibiotic called Leviquin for an infection that I had. And I didn't have restless legs initially, but I woke up. I must have kicked. And all of a sudden, I'm like, oh, God, I got to do sit-ups. I got to do push-ups. I was like, oh, man, I couldn't get it out of my system. It was amazing. That was restless legs. So restless legs is a misnomer, actually. Basically, it was discovered, uh, the, the guy who uh, discovered restless legs, he discovered it in people who were getting dialysis. And in dialysis, they clean out their blood, and they clean out their iron. And then he noticed a lot of people were moving. So um, it's really was not just the legs anymore. It could be uh, upper body, the whole body. I had a lady who had restless legs only on one side. Because restless leg syndrome is either about iron or nerve damage. She got in a motor vehicle accident, and she just had one side damage. She'd seen all kinds of neurologists, People, nobody could figure it out. She was on med after med after med. I had just come back from a conference in sleep on restless legs. I go, sounds like restless legs. But it was weird. It was a weird presentation. I went ahead and treated her. She comes back. This is for the first time. 
I've been able to sleep and that my pain was gone. It was amazing. I love sleep because you feel like a hero half the time. It's like, but any else? Yes. So if there is associated anxiety, yes. But if it's tossing and turning, but you're not really anxious, it could be sleep apnea. Because you, you might be on your back. Never really, you didn't really, really fall asleep. Um, and you're just basically going into deeper and deeper, and all of a sudden, and you just keep going. Because if I don't use my machine, I'm like a fish. I'm pulling the covers my wife, for my wife, just going and going and going. So it's like, yeah, I gotta use my machine. Yes? Um, our teacher said something about excessive medication something like bad for us, but if people still wake up refreshed, um, why is it bad? Like, Good, no, yeah, I... Well, you know, it's interesting. Because there's, two, there's two aspects to that, okay? Because Michael Jackson probably started with Benadryl, NyQuil. I have a lot of people on NyQuil. But the question I have is, why, did, why do you even need that in the first place? What was going on? A lot of activity, you're on your phone, you drink too much caffeine, is it too warm, too hot? Do you have restless legs? Or did you actually fall asleep and then apnea came on board. Or did you have periodic limb movement? So it's a really busy evaluation. So the question is. That's a good question, too. So potentially, yes, there are some medications like um, Valium. The class of medications that, that Valium falls under, which is called the benzodiazepines. That destroys your ability to get into REM sleep. Well, it turns out, if you remember, during dreams is when apnea is the worst. So they actually feel better a little bit, but they're not dreaming. And you need dreams. This was our gift. This is what we have to do. We have to dream. We have to go through our stages of sleep. So that, in, that question is really has got a lot of arms to it when it comes to the medications. I think, like Ambien, Zolpidem, everybody knows about Ambien, the one that helps you fall asleep. That really is a medic. First of all, the drug reps, when, Am when Ambien was not generic, they wouldn't come see me. Why? Because I got people off Ambien. But what happens is a lot of doctors will say, hey, we'll take this. But it wasn't meant for long term. You got a test coming up, you're in college, and you need to get some sleep because you're so amped up, uh, somebody died, some stressor, uh, you, you're, you're flying to Boston, you got a presentation, you got to get some sleep. That's where Ambien comes in. It's very short term. So, but the long term stuff is going to eat away at you. And then, and then you're not solving the problem because it eventually will wear off and then you're going to come back to your doctor, I need something stronger. And then it's stronger and stronger and stronger yet. Yes. So it actually has an effect for people your age group about 10 hours. So if you were to, now, when I say it has an effect, okay, that, that a level of activity, alertness that you have, roughly about 10 hours, okay, not everybody. If you're, you have some prior sleep debt and you need caffeine to get you going and it doesn't have that effect and you can crash with caffeine on board, I have people who do that all the time. Oh, I can go to sleep with a cup of coffee all the time. That worries me more. If I wanted to pull an all-nighter when I was in medical school, I'm drinking a cup of coffee, a candy bar, and I'm good all night long. That's how it's supposed to work. So when a person can go to sleep on caffeine, that worries me more, more because they have such a strong sleep drive that they crash beyond the effect of caffeine. So when I started sleeping better, I remember I was, I was pointing at some 
a piece of paper for a patient showing this, and I was doing this. I was like, oh, I don't have Parkinson's disease, I promise. I just drank too much caffeine. Yeah, it was too strong because I was sleeping better. So in theory, you shouldn't need caffeine. Questions? More? Yes? They'll be able to take anesthesia, you mean? Yeah, yeah, anesthesia. Yeah. Does that, like, affect any of the schedule? Uh, that's a great question. There's a lot of arms to that question, okay? So anesthesia is, is basically chemical sleep without pain associated after cutting and all that kind of stuff. There's a lot to it. It's interesting because if the anesthesiologist doesn't know, now we're assuming that you're going to go to surgery, you're going to get intubated. Right? Say the, the anesthesiologist doesn't know that you have sleep apnea. You get extubated. Here comes the apnea. You're totally drugged out with this anesthesia. And all of a sudden, he's, he or she is basically noticing that the oxygen is dropping. Oh, shoot. We better reintubate. Now it's officially a complication. Why? Because apnea just came back. It really was really simple. It just puts, put a CPAP machine in that will help this patient get through so you don't have to reintubate. Because once you reintubate, now you're going to the hospital, ICU, it's crazy. About anesthesia, anesthesia was told to me by a, uh, a resident when I was in medical school, depending on the amount of fat tissue you have in you, it will last for about 30 days. So it keeps getting released in your system. And if you've got uh, sleep apnea, it's going to be pretty bad for a while. And you're going to be kind of drugged out. And then eventually you'll start waking up after a week or so, normally. Yes? Um, no, actually, it's the other way around. So this, that's a great question. And I have to explain this to the patients almost every day. So I, I listen to the heart, and I says, oh, you got a heart murmur. OK, so how does it work? So I told you sleep apnea is where you stop breathing, okay? So but what's actually associated with stop breathing? You lose oxygen, right? Okay, so uh, let's put it this way. Let's go back. I'm gonna, you all know in your homes that depending on the season, the doors in your, your house are easier to close or harder to close, right? Depending on the season because the house is expanding or contracting, so the door is stickier or easier to close, okay? You've seen that before. So that's, the heart does the same thing in a lot of ways. So if the body is getting deprived of oxygen, the brain tells the heart, dude, you gotta pump harder. Because the tips of my fingers, the retinas of my, the vessels are getting, are lacking oxygen. So the pump, the, the, the pump, your pump, heart pump, pumps harder. Okay, now, the heart has four chambers. In between the chambers are valves. Well, the heart is a muscle. So if I was to do, like any other muscle, if I do curls here and I don't do curls here, this is going to be bigger than this side, right? So the, the heart is pumping harder, harder. It's getting bigger and bigger. The valves don't grow, they're fibers. So under normal circumstances, can you hear me? Yeah. So under normal circumstances, basically one valve, one chamber is filling up with blood and then it finally, when it's heavy enough, it opens up and it goes into the next chamber and it snaps close. Okay, so it does that all the time. It's very efficient. When the heart is growing, it kind of leaks through. While it's filling up, it's leaking through because it's pulling away from the chamber. And that's the murmur. Because a murmur is really that sound. You hear this bump, shh, bump, bump, shh, bump. Um, yes, uh, yesterday I saw a lady who hasn't followed up with me since 2015. And I'm like, oh, let me just do a weight. So she gained a little weight. I listened to her heart. 
She has this loud murmur. I looked back at the chart and I said, uh, you didn't have a murmur last time in 2015. And she has swelling in her legs. So already things are happening for her. She has apnea. She's using a machine, but something is happening. So it might not be effective treatment, so I need to retreat her, figure out what's going on. But um, yes, so sleep apnea, lack of oxygen, growing the heart, heart murmur, congestive heart failure, heart attack, stroke, the whole thing. Yes? Okay, so um, think, of, think of sleep as the engine in the train, and it's in the rhythm. This is normal, okay? Let's say that the engine is pulling the cars, and they're following the engine. What are the cars? The hormones, the GI tract, body temperature, blood products, immune system. So every once in a while, I have an oncologist who sends me a patient because the sed rate is high or there's something going on with the blood, it's off, because they know that sleep apnea can throw off everything. Because if sleep apnea, if this is the train normally, sleep apnea is doing this because of those arousals all night long. And so what are the cars doing? They're fishtailing. Everything's behind. So uh, some, people, you know, some people have depression, high blood pressure. Some people have you know, sinus infections all the time or just excessive sleepiness, can't get up and go. And some poor souls have it all. They're a mess. That's a true train wreck. That's really bad. But thank goodness we had a solution. Yes. So there's that immune system issue. Stage three and four sleep where the immune system kicks in. Okay, so uh, 18 years ago, before I used my machine, I used to be on an antibiotic two, three times a year. Being a doctor, I have access. I can, oh, I'm going to do this antibiotic because I got to get this over. So now, fast forward over all these years, I've been on antibiotics maybe twice in 18 years because my immune system is kicking, kicking boot now, basically. It's really beating up the infections. I'll get an infection, but I'll get through it easier. You know, I've already had the flu in my household. My daughter had the main one. She had the fever and the whole thing. And then my son's kind of had a little bit of it. Didn't touch me yet this year. And I've had people coming in this, you know, kind of sick. I don't would. So. Yes. So, taking melatonin in a form to stop your body's natural um, natural? Um, no, not necessarily. No, not necessarily. It won't. It won't uh, put off the normal surges. Um, the theory is that basically it will just help it, help it along, I suppose. You know, melatonin actually it used to be. If you look it up, melatonin is an anti anti cancer hormone. It's, that's old school stuff that nobody, if you pull out some old literature, and that's where I would recommend if in the future, if you're, a, you know, if you want to kind of look up some old research, if whatever you do, whatever you do in research, really know your stuff. Go back to the oldest stuff, and you're going to find out a lot of neat stuff. That's what I did with sleep. I just said, I'm going to read, go back. And you find all these little neat things that people have forgotten. We put it off to the side. We don't think about it. If you, if any one of you, I'm going to go on a different subject here real quick. So um, if any of you have the, have the desire to go into medical school, I'm going to recommend this. First, you should have the warm, fuzzy feeling about taking care of people. If you don't, don't do this. Okay? You have to enjoy the sciences because you can get a lot of it. Um, can't worry about the money because it's not there like it used to be. You just have to do it because you, you get this warm, fuzzy feeling. Um, be prepared for the rigor, the work. 
But it's really up to you. I mean, I can work as hard as I want. We all have this idea about physicians, you know, they're, um, that they work so hard and everything. Not really. You don't have to. It's up to you. It's just that when we start buying things, and we've got to pay those off, I'm going to work harder and harder and harder. So I'm going to work a lot. Uh, obstetricians are a little bit different. They work hard. They're night shift workers. They work in the day and during the night, too. So, um, but, you know, if you want to be a physician, it's that feeling. Uh, and then here's the other thing. This is key. Say um, you say to the interviewer, I want to take care of people. The interviewer is going to ask you, well, why don't you be a nurse? The difference between the nurse and the physician or the physician assistant or nurse practitioner is you want to take charge. You want to be the one responsible. You feel confident in yourself now, today, and taking responsible for somebody's life, you're good to go. Other questions? Yes. For, so, so nowadays, for medical school, which you guys are so far off <laughs> right now at this point, but that's okay. So if you're going to go into college, you're, Sienna, you're basically a senior, you're going to go. And so some of the things you might want to think about is balancing your college, your, your undergraduate life so that you're not just studying and trying to get the grade and, and just, you know, getting the A's and passing your MCATs and things of that sort. They want to know that you're a human being. Because we've kind of figured out that the guys that come in, the guys or gals who come in who are just kind of geeky, you know, I don't want these people touching my grandmother, okay? These people just don't get it. And I saw that in medical school. And, and where I was at at UC San Diego, they had the medical, it was a medical research focus, a uh, medical scientist. And they had the MD-PhD program. So the MD-PhD guys, they're going to do research. They're probably not going to touch patients. That's fine. But what about the family practitioners, internal medicine? Because you've got to be able to communicate. You've got to be able to look at them eye to eye and says, OK, Mrs. Sanchez, what are we going to do here? You know, it says, what's going on? Because 90% of the diagnosis is really based on the history. You've got to be a good history taker. I can make a diagnosis just by asking you questions, but I've got to ask the right questions. That's your secret. There's no other, there's no other clues. What's, what are the imaging? You know, the CT scans, the chest x-rays, the lab tests? That's just supportive. Supporting the diagnosis. If you ask the right questions, you went down the same right pathways, you shouldn't, be, you shouldn't miss it. And if you treat the patients correctly, they know that. If you're busy typing and stuff like that and doing this kind of stuff, they're going to pick up on that. They're not going to tell you anything. Or they're just not going to have confidence in you. So I try to avoid that. I put the paper in front of me. I look there, and I'm writing around. And then if they say something interesting, I'm putting my pen down. I'm looking at them. I'm just going to watch them. Got it. OK, get my pen going up, doing it again, making sure they know that I'm paying attention to them. But they're interesting. My patients are interesting. I love my patients. I, I learn a lot from them. You, you have to keep open mind. You know, the other, the, you know, one of the other things, too, in medical school, this huge auditorium, just like this, probably three times the size as this. And the dean's coming up. He looks at everybody. He goes, welcome to the club. What is that, what is that set? What kind of precedent is it that we're all that? No. As a physician, as a practitioner, a clinician, you're a public servant. OK, so you know more than most, and you get paid more than most. But you're still a public servant. Always remember that. Because these people are coming to your office. They're putting beans on your table. So you better do a darn good job. And hopefully you address their issues. Do you have to spend more time? 
because this is what medicine's doing. They're, they're basically cutting the time short. You only got 15 minutes to see this patient. I don't like that. It's the wrong job. Because the patient needs more, more time. Some people do, some people don't. So, other questions? Yes. No, it was an accident. It was a total accident. I was in family practice, and the place that I was located, or the place that it came up, Valley Regional, was looking for another doctor to, to practice and sleep. I already lost that job at the UCSF Alzheimer Center because the funding went bellied up. And they were looking for a doctor. I said, okay, well, I didn't know much about it. In medical school, when I went to medical school, I'm not gonna tell you when that was, um, I think we had probably a half hour on sleep education, four year curriculum. So it was not much. So I go to this place in Ohio, my mentor, who's got photographic memory, totally intelligent guy, I'm like, oh my God, I had no idea. I had no idea. So I fell in love and that was it. And then I became a patient too and I started using it. It's like, okay, so that was awesome. So it was kind of a, a natural progression because in my, what I did in family practice, which I really would encourage you to do because in family practice, you're gonna learn a lot about everything. And um, uh, it was a natural progression because sleep is related to diabetes, hypertension, kids, geriatrics, the whole thing, everything that we do in family practice. It was perfect. I'm hoping that maybe, uh, see, I'll be doing this for probably another 10 years. Maybe one of you is gonna probably wanna get, in, get into medicine, finally get into sleep. I'll give you my practice. <laughs> you can have it. I said, I don't want it to go away because I'm, there's only about three, let's, okay, I'm the youngest in town who's doing sleep. Uh, that might, might, be, might be true anymore, actually. There's, I think, some um, fellows that are doing it downtown. But I don't know how well they're doing it. It takes time. It took me a long time to get to where I'm at. So I'm going to say I'm the youngest you know, person that's been doing it, and this is all I do full time. So we need some replacements. We really do. And sleep research is awesome. Spectacular stuff. It's just every time I go to the conferences, they go somewhere everywhere Denver, Baltimore, Seattle, all over the place. Really neat stuff. So I encourage you to get into sleep. Thank you very much for coming. Yeah. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you.